the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail welcomes you. Join with Senior Pastor Dr. Mike Whitson as we present Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. All God's people said, Amen. just think about the circumstances of that song in Psalm 3 that David was being forsaken and attempted to be murdered by his own son. And he wrote that psalm uh, in the midst of that. That's, a, that's glorious, isn't it? Amen? It's so good to be here this morning. I'm thankful for the opportunity to share God's word here at First Baptist. Judy and I, as we travel, we seek every Sunday morning, if possible, uh, wherever we are, to listen to the service if we can. And my, how we're so blessed by both the, the singing and the preaching of God's Word. Hope you have your Bible this morning. Let's look together in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, the circumstances of Peter's writing is that of suffering. Uh, the main theme of the book is hope in the midst of suffering. Nero was the emperor of Rome. He was persecuting. Believers. This is about 63, 64 A.D. Uh, Nero was a wicked Roman emperor. Let me tell you how wicked he was. He killed his own mother. He would take Christians at night, get his soldiers to time to a pole, alive, dip them in pitch, set them aflame to illuminate his garden at night. He was a wicked man. In the midst of that, these believers needed to know that they know. They didn't need a, a hope so salvation in the sense of just hoping without it being real. They needed to know that they know. Uh, one of my dear friends and a dear friend of this church, Bill Stafford, it's now in his last days. And I didn't say that to say anything except to tell you to pray for his family. But I never will forget Bill used to say this, and I just picked up on it. I'm glad that I know that I know. I don't know how I know. If I knew how I knew, I wouldn't know, but I do know that I know. Amen? Verse 23, where the Bible says being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. For this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Wherefore, a connecting word, which means because that is true, this is true. Now I want to say to you, as we journey through this text, if the next part of this is not true of you, then you've never been born again. You say to a preacher, wait a minute. Being born again has nothing to do with my performance. Well, if Jesus does not change you and make you different, that you're obedient, then you need to trade in what you have for the real deal. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. God speak to us this morning. 
And may we hear you and obey you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to preach this morning on this subject. It's the same you, but you're brand new. It's the same you. God didn't do anything to you metaphysically. But God did make you a new creature. And you are a new creature headed for a new city, part of a new covenant, and you have been made new. We had a testimony meeting at a church I pastored and one of the men stood and here's what he said. He said, I'm glad the Lord gave me heart bypass surgery. And I said to him after the testimony meeting, you need to get your testimony biblical. I said, God didn't give you a heart bypass. God gave you a new heart. One man stood and said, well, I uh, really don't understand what it is to be a new creature in Christ. Well, I want to explain to you this morning what it means for you to be the same you, but to be brand new. I have three things I want to lift out of this text. First of all, I want to talk to you about you must experience the new birth. You must experience the new birth then I would say to you, you will, you will embrace new beliefs. And after you embrace new beliefs, you will exhibit new behavior. In other words, if you're birthed and you believe and you have beliefs, you'll have different lifestyle. You'll have a different worldview. You'll have a different life. In fact, you will be New. As we think about that this morning, as we look at verse 23 of chapter 1, would you read with me, being born again. Now what does that mean to you? Well, let me give you Barna's, Barna, his definition of what evangelicals in America say that born again means. He says, if you ask the average evangelical, in America, their definition of being born again is committing your life to Jesus Christ. I'd say to you that is unscriptural. The word born again means to be birthed from above. I want to quote Adrian Rogers word for word. Being born again, it's not you committing your life to Christ. It's Christ giving his life to you. So to be born again, there is a misconception of what it means to be born again. There's two different Greek words in the New Testament for life. There's the Greek word psyche and there's the Greek word zoe. Now the reason I would make the statement that God doesn't really want you to give your life to him. It is scriptural and Jesus preached this. I'll prove it to you. Turn with me to John 12. John 12. Jesus is preaching this the week of his death. He's telling his disciples in John 12 that he's going to the cross and he quotes and he magnifies that truth in verse 24. John 12, 24 is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says he, it says except a corn of wheat fall to the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He's speaking of his death on the cross. He's saying that I'm going to be that corn of wheat, I'm going to die, and the fruit of my death will be you being saved. But then he applies that same principle because see, here's the second aspect of the cross. When Jesus died, you died. Romans 6, 6, Galatians 2, 20. So he applies it to the believer and his disciples. Look at verse 25. Now I'm going to read it like it reads in the Greek. And I'm going to show you the two words. 
Because both of those words are used in verse 25. Look at verse 25. He that loveth his psyche. That's not Zoe. He that loves his natural life shall lose it. He that hateth his life. Now wait a minute, preacher. Are you telling me that Jesus said I'm to hate my life? Three times in the Gospels, Jesus said you're to hate your life. Three times. Now did Jesus mean what he said? Or did Jesus not say what he meant? He that loveth his psyche shall lose it. He that hateth his psyche in this world, we're talking about the here and now, shall keep it unto Zoe, Zoe, God's life. So the misconception of what it means to be born again is that many of us think that God wants our life when God really wants to give you his life and he wants to deposit his life inside of you. And the born again experience is when God quickens your dead spirit, gets out of heaven, gets inside of you. He makes you a new creature. He writes your name in the Lamb's book of life. He washes you in precious blood. He baptizes you by the Holy Spirit into Christ. He indwells you by the Holy Spirit. He seals you till the day of redemption. He anoints you with his very own life. He takes up residence and moves in and he's not moving out. Jesus Christ wants to live his life inside of you. So there's a misconception of what it means to be saved. Now turn back with me to 1 Peter. The second thing I want you to see as far as experiencing the new birth is not only there is a misconception, secondly, there's a means. What's the means of God saving you? Notice verse 23. You're saved by the incorruptible word of God. Now Jesus said when he was discussing being born again with Nicodemus in John 3, Jesus said you got to be born of water and the Spirit. James 1.18 says you must be begotten by the Word. Warren Wiersbe makes this observation. He said in order for you to be birthed naturally you need a father and a mother. In order for you to be birthed spiritually, you need the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Now you can't be saved anytime, any place, anywhere. God's not your errant boy. You can only be saved when the Word of God is preached or you're confronted with the gospel through a witness and the word of God's planted as a seed and the spirit of God brings you to Jesus and draws you to Christ. The means whereby you're saved is you're begotten by the word and you're birthed by the spirit. God brings you into the family of God through this miracle work of God and the means is the word and the spirit. The spirit is the executive person of the Godhead. He's the one that I call the high sheriff. He's here to arrest you and to bring you to Jesus. He's to corner you up with the law. He's to bring you to Christ. The third thing I want you to see in this text, it's not only the misconception, the means, but the message. What's the message? Look at verse 25. This is the gospel that's preached unto you. The word gospel means good news. You say, preacher, I'm thankful for the good news. Well, the problem with many who are part of the church is they've only embraced the good news mentally, but they've never heard the bad news spiritually. See, you can't appreciate the good news till you know the bad news. You say, what's the bad news? You're a sinner, and the best you deserve is hell. You've offended God with your sin, and you were in Adam, and you fell when Adam fell, and you're born into this world under condemnation and you are under the judgment of God 
And there's none that are righteous, no, not one. There's none that seek God, no, not one. Now, I want to tell you something about what happened to me in a meeting. Now, you're going to think that what I'm going to tell you is not true, but it is true. Not that things that I say are not true, but listen, this is really true. This is really true. I, I was preaching like this because, hey, I think it's time to get the hammer down. I think what we have in America is a bunch of peacocks strutting their way to hell. What I think we have is a lot of people who think that they don't deserve the judgment of God and the wrath of God. And so I preached in this ch church, and it was in the low country of South Carolina. I won't tell you exactly where. But I preached there, and, and that night I always have a book table. I've got some of my product here with me today. I've always had that since 1993. So this woman, I was setting up my book table to eat for the evening service, and so she came to me, and you knew, I, I, I knew that she wanted to give me a piece of her mind, that she didn't like my sermon that morning. And so she said to me, said, I'd like to speak to you a few moments. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, who are you to come into our church and to preach that I'm a sinner and that I deserve to go to hell? I said, well, ma'am, let me ask you a question. I said, have you ever read the Bible? I said, have you ever read chapter 1 of Romans, verse 18, through chapter 3, verse 23, where it says all Gentiles and all Jews are sinners and we've offended God with our sin. Now here's the part you're not going to believe. She looked at me, and here's what she said, Sammy. She said, if God would have met me and Paul would have met me, he would never have written that. <laughs> and then, oh yes, that's exactly what she said. I, know some, I knew you wouldn't think she said that. And then she looked at me and she said, you're one of those narrow-minded preachers, and I can tell, and I'm not going to stay and listen to you tonight and I am leaving right now, and I am not going to hear you again. Now, I took a half a baby aspirin to get over that, but I'll tell you something. <laughs> our country and our churches are filled with people that see themselves as good. But if you ever come to the Lord Jesus Christ biblically, under Holy Ghost conviction, you see yourself as an offense toward God, a lawbreaker, and you've offended him. And the good news is that God loves sinners and even enemies like you and I. And Jesus Christ died on the cross, shed his precious blood, and has been raised from the dead, and he ever lives to save all those who will come to him. The fourth thing I'd like for you to see about the text is the mandate. Now, I'm going to see something that's implied here. It's not in the text, but I promise you it's implied all throughout the New Testament. What is the mandate? Let me tell you what I sense is the missing word in the evangelical church today. It's the R word. Repentance. Repentance. Except ye repent, Jesus said, you'll all perish. Paul said, we preach the gospel, repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And unless God does a work in you of stinging you with godly sorrow and bringing you to the point and place that you see yourself and you're willing to turn from everything that you know is wrong to Christ and submit to him as Lord. Until that happens, you're not really born again. You must, you must submit to Christ. Surrender to him as Lord. And be willing to turn from everything that you know is wrong and give yourself freely and fully unconditionally to Christ. Zacchaeus did. He even paid back fourfold. 
Anybody in the Bible that gets saved is a person who repents. Then I want to say fifthly, and I'll move on. If you're born again, it's a miracle. See, there's a means, the Word of God, the Spirit of God. There's a message, there's bad news, there's good news. But then there's a miracle. If you're saved, it's God's fault. I mean, God did a miracle for you. God raised you from the dead. God reached down with a nail-scarred hand and picked you up out of the horrible pit. The greatest miracle in all the world is not somebody being healed physically. It's you being healed spiritually and God raising you from the dead. The same you, made brand new, you must experience the new birth. Secondly, you will embrace new beliefs. Look at verse 2 of chapter 2. As newborn babes. Let me read it like it reads in the Greek. Just born infants. In other words, you're just a baby. That's what happens when you first get saved. Now here's what a lot of preachers say, and I listen to them, and I understand what they're saying. It's normal for you to be a baby, but it's not normal for you to stay a baby. And we have too many people who think that you can be saved for years and years and remain a baby. I got news for you. It doesn't happen that way. You are expected to normally develop physically as a person and you are to normally develop spiritually as a believer. It is normal. Anything that is not of that normality is really not abnormal. It's artificial. You can't stay a baby in Jesus. If you're a baby in Jesus, he that begun a good work in you will continue it to the day of Christ. Now, is there a sense that all of us have a problem with our sinful nature and flesh and we're carnal? Yes, that's true. But do we develop? Yes, we do. How do we develop? It's all based on appetite. Look at the verse. Look what it says. As newborn babes, ye desire. That word desire means intense yearning. Now, I want to just be simple here in my preaching this morning. I want to ask you a question. Who wrote the Bible? Somebody say Holy Spirit. Who wrote the Bible? Holy Spirit. That's everybody said. Who wrote the Bible? Who lives in you? Who's going to teach you the Bible? Why are you not in the Bible every day then? Why are you not meditating and saturating yourself? Why do you, have, why do you not have a quiet time? Why, why don't you spend time in the Word on a daily basis? What is wrong with your appetite? Now, I would say to some of you that you bought into this kind of thinking that says that I'm saved, but really whether I have a quiet time or whether I'm disciplined in my Christian experience is optional. It is not optional. I want news for you. If you're the same old you and you've been made brand new, the Holy Spirit's come to live inside of you. And in John 14, 26, John 15, 26, John 16, 8 through 12, Jesus said in the upper room, the Holy Spirit's going to teach you the Bible. He's going to get you in the Bible. He's going to saturate you with the Bible. In fact, when people smell you, you're going to smell like a Bible. They are going to know that you've been in the Word because you have an appetite. When you have an appetite, you desire what? What do you have an appetite for? The sincere. Look at that word sincere in verse 2. It means you like the Bible. Let me, I'm just a simple person. Let me give you the Greek understanding of sincere. You like the Bible straight. You don't want it watered down. You want it just like it is. You don't argue with the Bible. You don't try to find loopholes with the, for your sin. You don't try to go as far as you can and explain away your sin. You don't emphasize your freedom. You emphasize that you're a slave to Christ. In other words, you love the Word. And you are in the Word. Listen to this statement. The Bible is life. The Bible gives life. And the Bible nurtures, nurtures, and nourishes life. It will grow you up. It will cause you to be different. 
You have a desire for what? The appetite for the sincere. Now look at the word milk. I, I want to go quickly because my time's getting away. Listen carefully what milk is. Milk is the basic Bible doctrines. You say, doctor, it's not important. Yes, it is. 1 Peter 3.15. Let's look at it. 1 Peter 3.15, just turn over there to it. What does 1 Peter 3.15 say? But sanctify, that means set apart the Lord God in your heart. Where does he live? He lives in your heart. Be ready always to give an answer. That's the Greek word for apologetics. You're to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Let me just give you what that says. That means we ought to be able to call you to the witness stand, cross-examine you, ask you what you believe biblically and what justification means, what sanctification means, what perpetuation means. You explain what the Bible teaches about the substitutionary death of Christ. Folks, we're, we're, we're not biblically, theologically grounded. And we're tossed to and fro with every wind of teaching. We're to have an appetite. Secondly, there's to be application. Now, when you embrace these new beliefs, has everything to do with appetite, has all to do with application. Look at verse 2 again. That ye may, that ye may, that ye may. Is it normal for you to grow? You know how you can tell whether people are growing? Holiness of life. You know how you can tell whether people are growing? They're burdened about lost people. You know how you can tell whether people are growing? They're sharing their faith. You know how you can tell whether people are growing? They love church. They love Jesus. They really desire to be obedient. They grow. They mature. They develop. What changes has God been making in your life lately? By teaching you the cross where he can get access to you. Remember I said it's his life. See, here's what I believe growing spiritually is. It's you knowing a deeper work of mortification of the cross cutting out of you everything that doesn't look like Jesus and Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, who lives on the inside of you, getting more access to you. He does that by renewing your mind. How does he renew your mind? With the Word of God, 2 Corinthians 3.18. So he renews your mind as you meditate and saturate yourself with Scripture, and then you adjust to him on a daily basis. So I want to ask you a personal question. What changes, what rearrangement, what alignment, has God been doing with you lately? What are you repenting of? I didn't say what you got involved in. I'm not talking about you being involved in religious activity. I want to know what's God cutting out of you. What's God, what's God dealing with you about? You say, well, preacher, I bet God deals with you all the time. You're not so hot yourself. Every one of us, God's dealing with us. Every one of us, God is always, 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 always working repentance in us. And the way I know I'm saved is I repented to get in. I continue to repent as I go on. And I repent and I trust Jesus and I'm trusting him to live his life through me because I know that I can't live the Christian life. Which brings me to my third point, and I'm finished. Not only you must experience the new birth, you must embrace new beliefs, but you, you will exhibit new behavior. Look at verse 1. Lay aside. Now that word lay aside means to strip off. It's a Greek word that means if, if, if this garment I'm wearing was on fire 
or this garment was soiled with acid, I would take it off and leave it off. How many of you would ever, ever wear it again? Have you figured this thing out? You're to wear the clothes that characterize the new creature you are. You're to put off the grave clothes and you're always every day to wear the grace clothes. Now I want you to notice these sins he mentions. I'm only going to deal with one. I have a friend of mine, he's now in heaven. As far as I'm concerned, he probably was the best Bible teacher I ever heard. I used to think Ron Dunn was the best Bible teacher I ever heard. But I'll put this man right beside him. His name was Wayne Barber. Wayne Barber pastored Woodland Park in Chattanooga where K. Arthur goes to church and where Spirio Zodiates went to church. And I had the opportunity to there preach a number of times. I had the opportunity with Bill Stafford to go overseas with Wayne. And Wayne says this about this text. Never heard anybody say this, but I think he's right. He said, why is malice the first thing you're to lay aside? Look at, the, look at the list in verse 1. Lay aside malice. Why is that first? Wayne makes this observation. He said, because all the other sins come out of malice. And malice is the root sin that causes these other sins to be made manifest. Now what are some of the other sins? Guile, that means you manipulate people for your benefit. Hypocrisy, what is that? That means you're living a double life. There's a lot of people living a double life. There's a lot of people living a double life. Envies, that's jealousy. Why can't you allow God to control your tongue? Because he doesn't really control your heart. Evil speakings. Now let's define malice. Malice is that deep, settled, unforgiving heart. Now, is it possible for you as a believer to be unforgiving? Yes. Is it possible for you to be offended? Yes. But I want to prerequisite that right now and say this. The more you know death to self, the least you are offended. So if you're a person who's offended easily, you're not very mature. Who do we get offended with? This is another quote from Bill Stafford. You'll never be really offended and become bitter in life until you get disappointed in a person or people that you have more confidence in than God. The first step of being unforgiving is to get disappointed. Because they didn't meet your expectations. Now when a person doesn't meet your expectations and you get disappointed, the second stage 
is you get disillusioned. The third stage is you get uh, despondent. And then you find yourself finally just becoming resentful. But here's the sad part. If somebody offends you, God gives you grace for you to forgive them. Now, I define grace differently than some people. I think grace is Christ in you enabling you to forgive. I base that on Ephesians 4, 32, there at the end of the chapter where it says that you're to be tenderhearted as Christ has forgiven you, you're to forgive others. But I found this out to be in my life. You may not find this out to be in your life, but I find that I can't forgive people even by choice unless Jesus is working in me. If, if preachers preach it's just a choice, then you're explaining away grace. By the way, folks, Without Jesus, I can't love anybody. And the ultimate of love is forgiving them. I preached in a church, a lady said to me, she said, Ron said, would you pray for me? My dad molested me growing up. It's estimated 30% of the people that are here this morning have been molested either by somebody in your family or a friend. <clears throat> Sexual abuse is real. She said, now he's got cancer. She said, I forgave him when I was converted but now I have the opportunity to take care of him until he dies. That can only be explained that she's a person that's new. But here's the second aspect of what I wanted to say. Let's say I offend you and you get bitter. And then you tell your husband or you tell your wife or you tell your friends in this church, they get no grace. What they do is they take up your offense and they fight your battle and they cause division in any church, any family, and hurt because you didn't deal with the matter of forgiveness. You became the poison. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews 12, don't let the root of bitterness come up and defile you and many others. Why is it many others that you defile? Because you were offended. I have a friend of mine who says, the greatest evidence that Christ lives in you is your giving. I think that's a good statement, but that's not the best statement. The greatest evidence that Christ lives in you is your forgiving. Because you'd be a member of this church and keep on giving. But how about this matter of forgiveness? Forgiveness will put you in a prison and destroy your life. I want to say this and I'm finished. 
you'll never forgive until you know for sure you've been forgiven. And if you are unforgiving, and that is practiced in your everyday life on the authority of God's word. You've never, you've never been saved. Let's stand together. standing together with our heads bowed as our musicians come. You know, the amazing aspect of this sermon is God can make you brand new here this morning. I'm going to be here at the front. The altar's open. God extends to you an opportunity for you. Realize you're a sinner. Understand that you've never come to repentance. And you can place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to him as Lord. So I'd invite those of you who have never, ever truly been born again to come to Christ. Then some of us would be honest. We are not disciplined in the word. We skip our quiet time. We don't spend time in the word, letting God speak to us. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.